So, good evening. Welcome to the Careers webinar. Um, it, my name is Sam Saunders from Royal Docks Boat Station. If you've ever been to Nationals, if you've qualified as your area regatta and made it to Nationals, that's Royal Docks Boat Station's patch of water. Um, so we're, we're down there operating on the docks, um, one of seven uh, training centers available to you. Hopefully you're familiar with your local one. Um, and it is my pleasure this evening to introduce to you Dan Wilkinson, um, long-time friend. We started off at the same time um, and diverged in, in what we chose to do. Um, I won't say too much about what Dan's been up to because I haven't got a clue, really, just scratching the surface. Um, but I do know that he is an international explorer. Um, he's done some first descents of, of rivers around the world. He's expeditions all over the place, been up mountains and down valleys, um, and has recently written a book as well, all about coaching in the outdoors. So hopefully there's a lot of exciting stuff that he's going to talk to us about. So um, without further ado, if I can figure this out, I'm going to try and put the spotlight onto Dan and hand over to him. Um, before I do that though, just to let you know, there is a Q&A button at the bottom. So if you have any questions or anything pops up, um, during the, the talk, then just type the questions into there and we'll set a little bit of time aside at the end so that we can go to each one of those. Okay, over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, without further ado, I'll just start talking to you about what I've been asked to come along and talk to uh, you all about. So um, I uh, work as an adventure sports coach, which is a really interesting cool sounding job title i think um, and i'm going to share some things about what an adventure coach is and, and a little bit myself as well so uh, i currently live in kendall in the lake district um, uh, and that's uh, quite a long journey i've taken to end up living in the lake district uh, and i'm a really really keen and passionate whitewater kayaker like that's one of my main passions in life. I really enjoy going kayaking in all shapes and sizes, but white water is what really floats my boat. I also have a wide range of personal experiences and high level qualifications and a huge variety of outdoor sports, which we'll talk about more throughout this evening. Um, uh, and I currently work for an organization half time called Joint Service Mountain Training Centers, uh, who teach people in the military to be adventurous training instructors um, it, from from the tri services range, and then the other half of my life, I spend working for myself and for other people in the outdoor world, um, doing some work for British canoeing and mountain training and things. Um, so this evening, I'm going to tell you a bit about what my actual job is. I'm going to tell you how I got to here, and how I've ended up doing what I do now. Uh, share a couple of career highlights, and just some thoughts around what the skill set of an adventure sports coach actually is. So. If it's something, a career you're considering or want to know more about, there's some ideas there that will help your development. So the first thing we've really got to think about is what is an actual adventure sport? So uh, we've got this idea of all of the different sports we do, you know, whether it be mountain biking, rock climbing, skiing, kayaking, um, and they take place in a variety of different environments and areas. So. Uh, for those of you who might have been fortunate enough to go skiing on a dry ski slope, uh, we tend to think of those as manufactured environments. Um, whereas if we go skiing and we're really lucky and we've managed to go skiing in a, in a ski trip to France or Italy or somewhere, we're kind of in a pieced area. And those environments that we've gone to are still being maintained by people for us to be able to do that sport in. Um, in the same way that a trail centre or a sport climbing venue would be. Um, an adventure sport itself, we can take part in our adventure sports in any of those environments, but the true definition of an adventure sport is something that takes place in the natural world. So we're trying to manage the environment that is part of that experience as well as the sport itself. So that would be like natural mountain bike riding over the mountains. Uh, trad climbing on the high mountain cliffs, ski touring uh, like on, on untracked, unpisted powders, or in natural whitewater rivers. So th those adventure sports are taking place in a really hyper dynamic natural environment, which adds a lot of extra things in for us as adventure sports coaches that you might not get uh, in the environment if you just work in a climbing wall, for example. 
So an adventure sports coach is a really cool sounding job title, but it's one of those things that people don't really know what it is, you know, and, and, and so one of the things that we think about doing when we're starting out with people, their careers and things is just helping them understand what an adventure sports coach is. So I, I kind of fill three different roles for people in their world. So I sometimes will be working on performance development. So teaching people the technical and tactical skills of kayaking, climbing, mountaineering, whatever they are. Sometimes I might not be doing that. I might just be taking them on a journey through that environment. So I'm acting as a guide, giving them a personal experience, a real highlight. And I've got a lot of friends at the moment that work in places like the Coolin Ridge, where you, you take people who don't normally want to do this in their own time, but they want to have that real experience of going somewhere exciting and doing something. So you might be working as a guide. Or on the third role that we can be fulfilling is doing some developmental experience, which might be helping people learn more about how they communicate with other peoples or, or how they manage fear. And so we are acting in a developmental way rather than a teaching technical skills or just giving people a highlight of experience. That's, that's really cool and interesting, but throughout all of those, no matter which of those roles we're fulfilling, we're always considering the welfare and safety of the people that we take out and look after. That's really important because what we want to be able to do is take little Johnny home at the end of the day and say, there you go, son, you've had a really nice day. Um, so that's that really important. And our, our ability to look after others' welfare and safety in the environments we take people into, those natural worlds, um, are constrained by our own personal ability in that environment and we'll talk some more about that later. But the main thrust of what we do in the adventure sports world, especially in my world, so I tend to spend a lot of time working in the performance development, teaching people technical and tactical skills so they can go and do their own journeys or have their own adventures or take other people into doing those work into those worlds. Is that we're aiming for independence. So the main thrust of what I'm doing is creating independent people, participants in those adventure sports. And that means that I have to share what we call the decision-making process with them. So a lot of my work is based around sharing decision-making, why we're doing what we're doing, where we're doing it, and how we're doing it with the, with the people I'm working with. So we're moving them through from this idea of they're fully dependent on me to take them into that environment through to being able to take themselves or their friends into that environment which is really cool because we get to go to some really, really cool environments. So um, this is me. I'm, I, I'm actually taking this photo, but this is with a team of people on the north face of Ben Nevis in winter. You know, this is a really big environment to go into. Again, ice climbing, a really big environment to take people into. Alpine mountaineering is another place that I get to work a lot in, in the Alps, in the uh, in Europe and taking people up those big peaks and so all the things that people need to be able to do to go into these environments they need to be independent they need to feel like they have some semblance of independence in those worlds so we do things like teach technical skills so here we are running a crevasse rescue se uh, session so people understand what to do if your friend falls in one of the slots in the glaciers and again, how to look after your partners and your friends. So we've, you can note down here, there's a wee rope looking after uh, Kate, the, la the lady in this picture. Yeah, and so we're teaching people these technical skills, how to paddle around on the river. And so uh, what I've come to and what I've come to think about now as my role is that uh, not only am I an adventure sports coach, but I'm also teaching other people to be instructors, leaders, coaches and guides. And that's kind of, I've come a full circle from being a participant through to taking other people to do that. And now my job actually is, is to teach other people to be those instructors, coaches, leaders and guides. So they can take others out to that world. So how did I get there? That's a really big question. So this is King's Cross Station. And I grew up here on the Regent's Canal in central London. Uh, I grew up on a narrow boat in a single parent family, which is not perhaps the most uh, traditional route into working in the outdoor world that there ever has been. 
Uh, and I didn't actually do that well at school. That's a bit more traditional in the outdoor world. So uh, the first time round of doing my A-levels, I got a, an E and an N and a U, and the N stands for nearly did all right, mate. Um, and so th there's been a lot of kind of thought in my head previously about this. And, you know, I, I wasn't very academic as a child, as a young person. And I think it's because I wasn't that motivated by school. Um, and, and it's mainly probably because I didn't understand what school could offer me at that time in my life, you know, the opportunities it was actually giving me. So anyway, left school at 18, failed A-levels. I was like, oh, this is, this is a bit rubbish. So I didn't know what to do with my life. So I started teaching uh, kayaking at the local kayak club, which I joined when I was 16 um, on the canal in London. And so I started working there, teaching other people to be kayakers, young people. And after a while, there was a, they did a trainee scheme. So I, I got taken under the wing of someone, which is very similar to what you might get in the cadets, I think. You know, you get taken under the wing, you get given a bit of responsibility, uh, you know, and you can see that there's, you, you're developing as a person as you're taking these other younger people out, teach them some hard skills, some technical skills like kayaking and those things. And so after a few years of that, I was like, Whew, I really enjoy this. I really love this. I'm 21. I'm thinking, I want to do this as a job for a little bit. So I went and did a couple of a couple more qualifications. And one of those qualifications I did was a whitewater kayak coach qualification at a place called Plazy Brennan. Uh, and when I was there, I realized that people make whole careers out of working in the outdoor world. Up to that point, I kind of thought it was something to do for a few years while you worked out what you wanted to do with your life. And then I realized that actually there's something like here, you know, I'm being taught by people who are 45, 50, who have worked in the outdoors their whole life. And I was thinking, that's really cool. I want to do that. I didn't really know at the school that that was an option. I definitely didn't know when I was 17 that that was a definite option for me in my life. Um, so I was like trying to work out how to do that best. And I realized, and I found out you can actually do a degree in outdoor leadership in the Lake District. So I was like, that's incredible. That's definitely what I'm going to sign up for. So um, obviously I didn't have very good A-levels. So I had to go back to school and redo my A-levels in order to be able to go and do an undergraduate degree in outdoor leadership, because I was like, that's actually really cool. I want to do that. And so that, then that motivation gave me the, the impetus to study a little bit more, redo my A-levels, got a place on an undergraduate degree. While I was there, I was exposed to a load of different coaches. We got practical programs. We got out once a week, every week, as part of our degree, kind of doing these adventurous activities. And, and for me, that was a real, real eye-opener, you know, being shown lots of different ways of coaching and teaching people things and also living with a community of other people who were really keen to go out kayaking and I actually learned to rock climb, did my first rock climb while I was a student at university. So I'm a fairly late to the adventurous world if you like. So you know 21 and I'm only just starting out teaching rock, like learning how to be a rock climber myself without even thinking about how to teach it. When I graduated from uni spent three years kind of fully embroiled in the outdoor world and uh it, it meant that i was like okay what's the next thing for me now you know i've got a couple of qualifications i didn't have many outdoor qualifications but i had a couple and i was like what do i do now and and i moved to north wales um because north wales has got a really high density of different activities in one small place and i recognized that what i needed to do was get a lot of experience in the activity themselves before starting kind of thinking about my future and teaching other people out and so I was in North Wales and I found a load of people that were fairly like-minded to me that really loved being in the outdoors and I got a lot of support from those people who were mentoring me um, and helping me develop and grow and that helped me realize that I can do it you know there's people who are working in the outdoor world that you know come from inner cities come from relatively poor backgrounds as well as kind of affluent areas and people that have been doing it and people that started in the outdoors when they were 25 and they're making career out of it now as well as people who have been rock climbing since they were born in effect and, and that kind of mindset of realizing that I can do it, it was really big for me I was like actually you know what this is something I can do 
And so I've had a career in the outdoors that spanned 20 years now from teaching kayaking on the canal in London to where, to where I sit now, where uh, I actually sit on British Canoe and Technical Group panels. I teach other people of, of British Canoe award providers to be those award providers and things. Um, and so I, I feel like I've had a really good, solid career, if you like, of a lot of different experience. And I'm just going to share a couple of career highlights with you now. In the next section, there's a couple of wee videos. So if they're a bit jerky or something, I apologise. We have had a sound and video test, so hopefully they'll run fine. But if they're terrible, just type in the question box, they're terrible, and then we, I'll, I'll flick on from those. Um, but this is one of my absolute career highlights, uh, where this truck is. We're parked at 4,500 metres in Peru, having driven and travelled to Peru to go and do a first descent by whitewater kayak of a river. And uh, it's something that's really, really cool. Because I grew up, and I was a young kayaking instructor in London. I kind of, I had these few videos of people doing these trips, and I never for one moment thought that it would be something that I could do. You know, be be somewhere so random like Peru, uh, trying to do a first descent by a kayak. And I felt like I'd come. And even now, when I'm thinking about it, I'm like, I, I just think it's so cool because I've gone from watching it on an old VHS. They're like the video cassettes that people put in their slots in the olden days. I've gone from watching it on VHS to actually kind of being involved in the world where I'm doing first descents by kayak of really cool rivers. So, and those sort of experiences have taken me to these really, really cool places. Um, so this is Nepal, like living out of our kayaks on a river for a multi-day trip. Um, and I'm actually working in this picture. These these are people that are paying me to take them down the river. And I just can't believe that, you know, I, I still can't believe that people are willing to pay me and I've got to the point where that happens. But camping on a river is one of the real highlights of a career for me. I've just got a wee clip in a moment of a riverside camp to show you, but you're in the middle of nowhere all you've got with you is the stuff you're carrying in your kayak you know and the kayaks are quite small things you've got to think really carefully about what you're taking so you you notice we're using our kayak paddles as poles rather than you know having a tent or anything we've just got a tarp to sleep underneath in the middle of this huge landscape in the himalaya <laughs> So, a quick tour around the camp. Poor sleeping area in here. Very posh bivy bag. This is where the rest of us are hanging out last night. Sleeping under the tarp. It did rain a little bit. Dan's the last one in bed. Morning, Dan. Over here we've got the boat park. The living and cooking area is over here, where hopefully breakfast is going to be served soon. I share that because, like these little experiences of trips that I've been on, are real highlights for me. And that by working in the outdoors, it's given me the ability to continue to develop my personal skills to a point where I'm going on trips and expeditions like these in really remote far flung places this is in peru again on a different river um, because i've been able to do it professionally while taking other people out i've managed to hone my personal skills and i've managed to work with a community of other coaches and people who share that love for going on adventures and experiencing really cool things like doing a first descent of a river by kayak but I find not only the kayaking bit and element of it really nice, this whole community living, you know, where we're all on the river, we're all together, we're all sharing the same goal. It's something that I hadn't experienced much in my life until I was in this environment. And it, it's kind of 
change my mindset and my feelings about the world and stuff really really powerfully for me um and you know just even just simple things like having to fashion our own tools out of sticks to be able to get the pot off the fire and things are a real real highlights of my life and taking people around in these places and showing that you don't have to just do things in one way you know there's multiple ways of doing things and that's absolutely fine it doesn't always go well though so um one of the biggest things i think that i've learned through my career and the career highlights that uh, is given me is that when it goes wrong how we deal with things going wrong so obviously I, I remember when i was 17 18 and i failed by a levels you know i felt like such an abject failure as a person i was like well this is how i'm being judged on you know and and so this is another time i've got a wee clip here of the time when we were doing the first descent of a river and we got stuck and there was a bit of river we couldn't paddle down and we we're in the bottom of a gorge and we had to climb out of it and it took us six hours carrying all our kayaks and all our equipment to take it to get out so uh, we've obviously abandoned the santa thomas uh, we slept last night on uh, what we'll refer to as cowpat beach just above the box canyon uh, we're about a quarter of the way into our hike out to the nearest roadhead where we hope to find a truck or a car. Oh man, this is just brutal. But you can see how far we've come. That's one big canyon. And we're getting there. The guy on the horse said it's half an hour, but I don't believe him. It's gonna be a lot more. And <coughs> And by experiencing failures in loads of different places, in, in loads of different ways, like having to hike out of a canyon in Peru, I've learned a lot more about myself, I've learned a lot more about the world, and I feel like I've become a much more resilient person to things. So when they go wrong, you know, like, you know, let, let's take, for example, they're building a new housing estate next to my house at the moment. We didn't know that when we bought the house. Yeah, but when things like that happen, you're like, well, I can put this into the pitch in the grand scheme of what's actually going on here. Is it a big problem or is it not a big problem? And kind of give us that perspective on things that I might not have got had I not been able to do these different trips and these and get things wrong in different ways and different places. Um, but as I mentioned, I, I absolutely love kayaking, you know, it, it, and it's one of the reasons why I go to these places um, for, for not only the camaraderie and to explore and experiment and test myself as a person, but also because I really enjoy it. So there's a wee video clip of some kayaking. Mm.
uh, and the reason I share these personal skills is because what that's done, and as I've realised throughout these different experiences I've had, you know, kayaking Peru, taking people kayaking in the Himalaya, you know, taking go, working on glaciers and all these things, was that actually I, I've really enjoyed taking people to places and sharing and coaching and developing them. Um, and so on one of these trips that, that I had back in uh, 2018 or something like that, we were talking about the fact that there, you know, there didn't seem to be a lot of resources out there for how we were sharing, how we as a community of coaches and people develop other people and work as adventure sports coaches and things. Um, so uh, a really, really long story short, you know, I've already mentioned that I failed my A-levels, but I went back, I redid them, I did an undergraduate degree. Um, and then some years later, I found myself with the opportunity to do a master's in performance coaching. Um, and, and I was quite daunted by that prospect. Now, as I mentioned, I wasn't very academic at school, but I kind of signed up for it as a new challenge and a new thing to do. And I found that I really enjoyed it. And I think that I was really enjoying it because I was really inspired and motivated by the subject we were talking about and that I had real passion for teaching and developing people and things. Um, so we were in Nepal back in 2018 with a group of friends on a trip, all of whom work in the outdoors. And we were kind of moaning and saying there wasn't that much to support people to understand coaching and working in the outdoor world and all these things. And traditionally, you know, people like to moan about things and then don't do anything about it. And that was definitely us. Um, we were like, oh, it'd be really good if there was a book that had this in it or there was a film that had this in it or something like that. And, and, and so in the end, while we were in a, one of our Jeep, many Jeep rides on one of these many trips that I've been on, we kind of fleshed out <coughs> some ideas for what we'd like to see in a book to support junior coaches and people coming into our world and working in the adventure world. Um, and obviously we did nothing with that because we like moaning about things and not doing anything about it. You know? But we had a wee little list. Uh, and then I was working with my friend Paul back um, for mountain training. We were doing some teaching and learning workshops for people that develop, uh, deliver MLs and rock climbing instructor awards and things. And and they were asking us, you know, how have you found all this stuff out? And I'm like, well, I had to do a master's to find all this stuff out. And they were saying, well, I don't have time to do a master's. I don't really want to do a master's. I was like, okay, that's you know, totally fair enough. And this is in February 2020. And then about a month later, the entire world stopped you know it, it just stopped still didn't it and all of my freelance work got cancelled you know uh, i was just literally sat at home going oh this is really lovely isn't it and but what am i going to do with all this time and and then we kind of had a remembrance back to the half form conversation that we'd had back in 2018 and I had a wee little chapter list and stuff so we dusted off that chapter list my friend paul and i kind of he lives in gloucester so you know we did all this remotely but uh, dusted off that chapter list and I actually became an author of a book which was amazing and I, I'm just going to share for the next 10 minutes or so the story of how the book came to be and then there'll be some time for questions and stuff so um, I was doing as I've mentioned I, I ended up doing a master's it took me some years to kind of build up the courage to sign up for it um, and it's linked to a British Canoeing Awards that's now called the Coaching Diploma that was then called the UKCC Level 4. And, and basically I got to that point because I'd, I'd worked through the old British Canoeing Awards badges as part of my professional development, you know, as I, as I was working through the outdoors, I kind of did my Level 2, then my Level 3, then my Level 4, uh, and then I did a Level 5 coach and then uh, once you've become a level five coach you can then start teaching other people to be coaches and things and so i start working as a coach educator and i'm like i don't think i know enough about coaching to really be doing this very to be doing this justice and that's that's how i ended up signing up for a master's so I, was like, I want to know some more about this so i can then share my knowledge with other people and feel like i'm doing a really good job of teaching people and so i had to read all these really deep papers and and i uh, Academic papers and me were not, we weren't aligned in terms of what we were looking for. I was looking for something that said, this means this, this is how you might want to use it in your practice. They were using 7,000 words of like 
risk benefit decisions outlined in Collins and Collins 2013. I'm listening to that going, this is not, this doesn't really make sense to me. I'm having to read a paper two or three times. It doesn't really put it into the context of the world that I work in. But we knew there was a need for that because there's a lack of resources that support the people that we've been working with, like those mountain training directors. And there was nothing that really bridged that gap between research and actual practice, which meant that if people came on a development course, they came on a coach education training course, on that pathway through to assessment, their development was totally to chance. I was really lucky when I was doing my awards and getting those qualifications because I lived in North Wales with a load of other people who already had them. So I could go and ask some questions. But if you live in London or if you live in Somerset or if you live you know, on the East Coast somewhere, there's not those, that community of people around you to get those questions. We're like, well, this is really, really key for us to support those. And so we had the chapter list. We had the idea of writing a book back in February, back in March last year. And I bet it was daunting. But so it, like good coaches, we actually sat down and set ourselves some aims of what we were trying to do. Because if I'm trying to develop, just think about it like this, if I'm trying to develop independence in the people I'm working with, what we want to do first is work out what their aim are, what are they trying to achieve? What is the goal they're working to? And then take it back from there so we can work out all the little steps in order to help them reach their goal. And so the first thing I wanted to be really clear was that it had to be written in plain English and didn't have avoid avoiding academic language because of the struggle I'd had reading those papers while I was doing my master's degree. And we wanted to make sure it was based on evidence rather than just like, I think this, therefore that's what I'm going to write down. And I wanted it to be really comprehensive. I was trying to distill that two years of master's plus 20 years of working the outdoors into like a volume that would be usable and user friendly for people. And, and the one thing I was really passionate about was uh, was that I'd want it to be the book I'd want to read earlier in my career. And that meant it had to have lots and lots of pretty pictures in it, full colour photos, easy diagrams, big, well spaced out words rather than lots and lots of dense text like a school textbook or something. Um, so you can see there's a lot in it. That's two full pages of chapters, 360 pages of a book that we ended up writing during lockdown. But hopefully you can see that what we've created and the reason it's 360 pages because we've got lots of photos in it to make it visually pleasing so people want to pick it up and look at it and read it um, uh, with lots of diagrams. And we've also managed to reach out to lots of other people. So this is a story by Katie Curd, who's a mountain bike coach. And she worked, she raced on the World Cup downhill circuit, uh, you know, so we, and because we were really lucky that everybody, no one else was doing anything because we were all locked down. So we managed to reach out to all the people that we knew that worked in the outdoors in different ways and different fields and get them to contribute their knowledge to our project as well, which is superb. And one of the big, one of the big things that we found out, one of the things that we've taken away from this is that as adventure sports coaches, we need the following. So we need to be able to have a good understanding of the coaching process, you know, how people learn, how we present information, how we let people play with that information. We need to be personally skilled in the environment that we go into. You know, and this is why I tell you about all the kayaking that I've done because that, demo, uh, you know, I haven't spoken about the climbing and the mountaineering and the skiing and stuff, but that demonstrates that that personal performance means that I am comfortable in the environment, in that really risky, dynamic environment. So I can then have the ability to use and operate my coaching process and think about the teaching and learning that I'm trying to do in that environment, rather than just trying to think about myself getting down that environment or looking after myself in that environment. I've got the ability to look after other people there. And the third key skill that we have to have as adventure sports coaches or, you know, is the ability to maintain, read and relate to people. So I need to be able to build relationships so the people I'm taking into these environments trust me and I trust them, you know, to tell me when they're feeling scared and I, they trust me to say, ah, oh, this is the right rapid for you to run, this is not the right rapid for you to run, this is the right climb for you and all those things. Um, but moving on from that, there are ability to use those to do those three things is constrained by four bigger elements, four kind of global things. So, uh, and these are what I now teach as part of my coach education courses. So, you know, 
our ability to use the coaching process is is really constrained by our beliefs, our coaching philosophy, what we believe good teaching and learning to look like, you know, how I believe that the world works, what I value as a person. Um, and that's that becomes really apparent, you know, as we're working when our philosophies and our beliefs aren't aligned with the other people that we're working with. Um, so, uh, yeah. We also need to be able to learn from our own experiences and recognize different options for action. So that, and that comes into this idea of reflective practice for us. Um, and we need to have really good situation awareness. So uh, that that's into both reading the environment that we're taking people into. So how wild is that water? How rough is the sea? How windy is the lake? And then reading the people we're taking into that environment. So how is Fred feeling about going onto that really windy lake? And then our ability to incorporate lots of different factors because we're working in these really big, risky environments. So we have to be able to take into all account all of those factors in order to make the best choices for the people we're taking out there. So that gives us our decision making. And so, you know, if we we're going to close this circle, my um, my world, my work as an adventure sports coach involves taking people out into really cool places and doing really cool things with them from ice climbing in Canada through to ski touring in Norway through to I'm in Scotland this week I'm literally in Scotland at the moment teaching people to be advanced whitewater river leaders um, but I am fully aware that all of those things and those jobs that I'm doing those roles I'm fulfilling are impacted by my ability to operationalize to use the coaching process to give good teaching in really dynamic environments and that's really affected by my philosophy my reflective practice my situational awareness and my decision making so just to open up a couple of these a little bit more the philosophy is the most hidden of our behind the scenes thought processes and it's like a belief, something we've got inside ourselves. So one of the things that I really value is honesty, you know, and I like being honest with clients and people I work with. So, I, you know, if I'm doing something new or I'm taking people to a new environment, I say, I've never been here before, but I think it will work really well for us. Yeah. Um, because that underpins our behaviours. Um, and making your philosophy more explicit supports your decision-making process. So if I understand why I'm feeling like I think, or why I believe what I believe, I can then support my decision-making process. I'm just going to skip on through this. And then situational awareness for us as adventure sports coaches. There's kind of three key factors. So environmental comprehension, that's awareness of the world we're in. Awareness of the people we're with. And then an awareness of us and the session we're delivering, so how my behaviours are impacting on the people I'm taking out. And situational awareness in a nutshell is a pro the process of noticing, understanding, and then predicting f into the future, which gives us our decision making. So situational awareness means that I can be aware of all the choices that I have to make when I'm out on the ground. So my key takeaways from all the work and all the world that I've done is that my philosophy impacts on my decision making process. My situational awareness impacts on my decision making process. And then this is something for you all to consider how this might fit into your world. So by sharing both what I'm seeing and what that means to me, I can support people to develop their decision making by increasing their situational awareness. So basically now in my world as an adventure sports coach, while I'm focusing on technical and tactical skills, I'm actually trying to develop people's situational awareness to support their decision making. And I've got to that process for a really long journey of going, growing up in central London, realising that I can go and do this as a job and then being motivated by the job and enjoying the job so much that I wanted to continue to develop and work in that outdoor field, which has led to me to get loads of different qualifications um, and, be, and then have the opportunity to use those qualifications in different places, which has led full circle through to from failing A-levels to having written a book which is a personal journey that I'm quite proud of myself. And we're flying straight into question time, so I'm vaguely aware of the time. So uh, 
if you do have questions about anything I've spoke about, you please chuck them into your chat boxes um, at the bottom there, and um, I'll let I'll just come off stop share so I go bigger on your screens. Um, and over at, to at, the, at the moment, uh, we've got no questions in the Q and A box. Um, but if there is anything that, that people want to ask, you can type it into the Q&A box, you can type it into the chat, or you can raise your hand and I can um, take you off mute and allow you to ask the question directly. So uh, give the slow typers a minute or two and uh, we'll take it mute. Can you see that one that's just popped up, Dan? Yeah. Uh, good evening, so, Gemma. Just just uh, to let you know that the people in the webinar can't see the chat. It only comes to us at the moment. So it's, uh, if I read the question, then you could, you could answer. Uh, so Gemma says, for a teenager hoping to get into adventure coaching, what experience or courses would you recommend they do? Great. Um, Good evening, Gemma. Uh, I think, like, I, I was probably sat where you, you, you're sat at the moment when I was 17, thinking, how on earth do I get into this world or how do I do this more? So, um, th there's a couple of different things we can think about doing. Uh, you know, you're in a really fortunate position with the, with the world, the cadets world that you inhabit because you've got the ability to go on some different adventurous cadet courses. And just getting experience in any adventurous world is really important initially, you know. So just like uh, uh, learning how to be on a sailing ship, a tall ship, and look after yourself, for example, is really important. As you kind of go through those things, and and what what I found really helpful for me was to focus on one activity first. So kayaking being my main passion, I kind of focused my efforts on that, and the other things have fallen into place. So um kind of think about what it is what activities you're really passionate about or what what activities you that you want to be able to take other people to do and work out the best pathway for you to get those different experiences so you you know if we think about getting a bit of personal skills maybe just going to a climbing wall and, you, and there's an award called the climbing wall assistant which is a one-day course once you've done a bit of time in an indoor climbing wall you could do that course and then you get a bit of time and a bit of experience helping out and then as that grows that experience grows you can then do the climb wall instructor award so i wouldn't i wouldn't tell you necessarily to go and do the british canoe and paddle sport level one if you don't like kayaking that, that doesn't seem to be a very sensible thing to do but what i would say is work out what sports or activities it is that you really enjoy and then spend a bit of time researching them and early on you know all of these awards nowadays none of these national governing bodies say you have to have a minimum age so you know the the climate wall assistant um indoor assistant award is open to anybody over 14 which is amazing so you can do that course and then you can go and help out your climate wall running kids sessions and things and get some experience of working with young people um, and likewise the british canoeing awards the paddle sport instructor you can do it at any age now you know um there's a little bit of thing about you you can't independently work with people until you're 18 you know that's but that's a legal thing not a you can't do that thing so just working out what what activity it is you're really passionate about you know if it's sailing or if it's anything else the other couple of things that are really worth thinking about doing are when you become 16, 17, 18, trying to get some work experience in an activity centre. You know, so uh, places like PGL employ people, your local sea cadets, you know, who you take, can you work with the younger cadets and things? And then there's still outdoor degrees out there that are really good. So um, uh, if you want to work in the outdoor world, a degree is definitely not the only way into it but what i found it gave me even though i was a bit older was it gave me three years to really concentrate on developing my personal skills so when i came out of the other end of that i had the personal skills that meant i could go and do the the awards the national governing body awards that let me work in the outdoor world can i just add a few little bits from a sea cadet perspective there? definitely so. um so for as part of your cadet experience 
you've got the, the basic, the intermediate and the advanced awards. And they build, they're already mapped out towards becoming an instructor in a lot of those things. So there are pathways that are available through Westminster, um, whereby if you wanted to become a dinghy sailing instructor, for example, all of the prerequisites that you need to do that are mapped out and they're available. And as Dan said, within the cadet forces environment, you are in the best possible place for accessing these training courses. Um, they're incredibly low cost, they're incredibly accessible, and there's a lot of them. So inside the cadets is, is a really great place to begin your journey. Also, for each of the disciplines, there will be an area staff officer. So each of your areas will have somebody who you can get in touch with through your unit, um, who will know what's going on for paddle sport, for sailing, for shooting, for drills, all of these things that are available, um, mountain biking, uh, I think there's climbing as well. Uh, so you can contact your ASO to find out what's going on, find out who else is interested. And then if you get a, a, a group of people together, and if you can create a demand for particular training courses, then the ASO's job is to, to try and help meet those demands. Um, there's also the, the offshore fleet, and you mentioned a little bit about tall ships, but if you can get offshore, it's a really, really great way of gaining a variety of experience in a very short amount of time. Okay, is there any more questions from any more people? There we go. You're very welcome, Gemma. Um, something else that I'm going to mention, and I'm also a paddler like Dan. Um, in fact, we started on the same training scheme <laughs> at the same time all those years ago. Um, the cadets do run some expeditions. So uh, I think it's called the Scots Paddle or the Y Paddle, and they are multi-day living out of your boat, camping and paddling expeditions. I'm sure they do it for adventure training, um, going up mountains as well. Uh, so it's worth looking for those if that's something that interests you. Um, they are, I've been on a couple of them. They are absolutely amazing. Go to some of the, the most amazing places. I think the, the Scott Paddle we did, we started by the Glen Finnan Viaducts, which is the um, made famous at the other end of the line from platform nine and three quarters at King's Cross. It's where the Hogwarts Express went along. So that was the beginning of our week was uh, starting underneath the Viaduct. The Hogwarts Express ended up in the sea paddling with seals. So, uh, quite, a, quite a trip, that one. Um, there's nothing else showing up in the Q&A. Nothing else showing up in the chat. So we'll give you a few more minutes. If you've got any questions you want to know, um, if it's either down to where do you go to the loo when you're camping by the side of a river, um, or what do you eat when you're on expedition, or where's the best place you've ever been? Anything like that. So throw it out there. There's, there's a few minutes left. We've got five minutes. And um, so if there's anything else that comes up, do let us know. And also just to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and is going to be put up on the TNA website. If you don't know what the TNA website is, ask the adults in your unit. They can access the TNA website. So if you thought it was interesting and you'd like to share it with your friends at your unit or anyone else for that matter, um, they can find it on the TNA. It's going to take a few days to get there, but it's going to be stored online for future reference. Uh, for record, we go to the toilet by digging a hole. <laughs> and uh, worth mentioning that you burn the loo paper, I believe. Burn the loo paper, yeah. It doesn't decompose very well. No. no, and then we take all the rest of our rubbish out with us. Absolutely. Uh, just a, a quick share from my side, but one of the, the things that really hit home for me from going to these places and being in these remote environments is a, a deeper respect for nature and for the environment that we inhabit. And that's stuck with me and that actually influences my life in the city. I live in, in London, everything's available, everything's really convenient. Yet I'm kind of free to avoid it, if you will, because I've seen how little you need to get by and i've seen how a little bit of ingenuity like using those sticks as uh, hand supports really can and you know people love to tell you a gadget but um my my understanding respect and awe of nature has really come from spending time in it 
So uh, it's, it's, it's eye opening for you to get yourself out there. We've got a question in the Q and A. What's the best food to eat on one of those expeditions from Able to Death Hayes? Um, I've eaten some really, uh, I've eaten some really bad food on expeditions. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm still trying to work out the best food to eat on a trip, but um, it generally, because because we, we're I probably normally packing into a kayak, so you've got really limited space. By the time you've put your your sleeping bag in there and your cooking stuff and your emergency kit and your spare clothes and things, you know. So uh, I spent a lot of time eating um, rice and beets and lentils when we we're in Nepal, which is like a fairly standard thing but what the problem with it, it takes like 20 minutes or half an hour to cook on the st stove because it's obviously pretty deep, dried and dehydrated you spend a lot of time stirring getting smoke in your eyes and stuff while you're making that so de what, while it's really good because it's really compact it's definitely not the best thing i've ever eaten on an expedition um, one time we were, when we were in kenya uh, we were we were watching the locals cooking and they 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 said, "Oh, this is for us, and we'll make you something else." And we're like, "Oh no, 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 we want to eat what you're eating," without really realizing what we were signing up for. And so, when we were served our plate of goat intestine, that was a complete low point in terms of food on an expedition because you could still see the tubes in it. Um, but uh, well, yeah, but one of my, my favourite things is uh, dried mango. It's super sweet. Mm. It's, uh, it's it's quite small and light. Mm. Really good. Yeah, we take a lot of jerky, so we get some protein on, you know, cooked into our food, because that's one of the things. Protein's quite bulky, so taking that with you is quite challenging. So things like beef jerky, really highly recommended. I like things that you can snack on throughout the day. They call it gorp. Good old raisins and peanuts, and if you throw some chocolate M and M's in there as well. Okay, any more for any more? We're at 7.59, so 10 out of 10 for timing on that one, Dan. Um, if there's no more questions, then I'm going to say a huge thank you, Dan, for giving your time this evening uh, to talk a little bit about your career and what it is you've been up to. Um, and thank you all for coming along to find out about it. Um, as I said, this is uh, going to be on the TNA website. If anything comes up later on, then get a hold of your unit and ask them to uh, get hold of the virtual cadet people, the virtual training team, um, and they'll be able to, to direct you to the right place for any questions. We've got another one. Oh, I says thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, okay, so that's it. I'm gonna gonna pull the plug in a second. Thanks again, Dan, and um, hopefully we'll see you up in the hills or down in a river. Sometime yeah. Soon. Thank you very much, everyone. I hope you have a lovely evening. All right. Bye-bye.